Thank you. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. And uh, uh, just uh, one thing about my background. I'm in the India-China America Institute in the United States. I'm in the Shanghai Institute for International Studies in China. And I'm in the Singapore EU Center. And for the past eight years, uh, starting from the subprime crisis in the US, we sort of knew that it would happen and it would be global. I've been interested in the problems of G7 and the so-called BRICS countries. I will talk about the themes mentioned in the first slide very briefly, two sides of the crisis, post-crisis prospects, U.S. competitiveness, world trade and investment, uh, and the growth model, particularly in the case of U.S. Uh, I strongly believe that this is um, what we are going through has two sides. It's a uh, cyclical crisis that will probably take in the U.S. at least until 2014-15 to really clear out. But I also believe that it's a structural transition. When we look at the cyclical crisis and look at the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the emerging Asia or any other developed country, the contraction had the same shape, but only in the emerging markets in Asia it was not negative. In the US, it was very painful, 2% plus. Now, compare that with uh, Russia, Germany, Finland, and a few other countries in Europe, not as painful. But the implications, I think, go far further. If we look at the secular transition, on the other hand, we have come to a point where the BRIC countries, uh, China, India, Russia, Brazil, uh, according to Jim O'Neill from Goldman Sachs in 2001, would overtake uh, United States, China would overtake United States 2042. About a year ago, I called him and said that I did the same study they did with the factoring in the developments of the past 10 years, and according to my data, China will overtake the United States by 2028. And if you factor the implications of this crisis, it will probably happen 2020s in early 20s. Uh, this is total GDP, of course, not GDP per capita. So what we are seeing and what we thought would happen in two to three to four decades is happening to a great extent in the next decade. And that's why I think this is a very dangerous moment of history. Uh, and naturally, this, it will mean that in the long run, by 2050, China uh, is expected to have the largest economy in terms of the GD, GDP. But the pressure to that position, to that role, is, is uh, growing very fast, not just because of the inherent growth potential of the BRICS, of China, of emerging Asia, but because of the mistakes that have been made in the developed countries. Now, if we look at the situation in the United States and the uh, plunge of the output gap, and particularly from the point of unemployment, it was 10% uh, not so long ago, not, now perhaps 9%, and people will feel a little bit relieved. They shouldn't. The numbers are lower, not because you have major uh, transformation, but because many people gave up the hope of finding a job. So you have a structural transition in the workforce, and that means that you have a lot of problems in the future in terms of retraining, reskilling, and so on and so forth. If you include numbers from the temporary unemployed, we're talking about 15, 17 perhaps, uh, perhaps a little bit less, 14 to 16 percent, depending who we might listen to. So this is a very, very serious crisis in terms of unemployment. Now, if you look at the two reasons for the crisis, especially in the United States, the financial sector and the housing market, what do we see? In the case of the banking sector, for instance, the problem of the two big, two failed banks remains. Uh, some, are, some might argue, especially my more pessimistic friends, that the situation is now worse because you don't have regulatory overview that might be able to contain future problems. But also, by har harvesting the smaller players, the bigger players are actually even bigger. And they are even more global. That you can see when you look at the concentration of deposits or the concentration of, of assets in, in these banks, which tends to be more than 40% or so. If we look at the housing market, on the other hand, uh, many people thought that by now we would have had a rebound. I wasn't one of those. I always thought that this would take until 2014-15, and I'm on the record on this since 2008 in the fall. Uh, it seems that at least we will have another 5 to 10% decline of the prices in the near future. If you listen to Robert Schiller, one of the analysts who was actually right about this crisis in advance, uh, he would argue perhaps 15, 20% decline. It will get worse before it will get any better, and that's due to the foreclosures in the United States. What about competitiveness and innovation? Many people argue that America is on a sort of a structural decline and <clears throat> the future looks very, very murky. Uh, however, I'm not one of those. Uh, 
uh, United States has a more flexible labor market than the European countries. It's not rigid in the same way. It's more adaptable as a society. It has shown great uh, uh, resilience in, in moments of adversity, and I think this is one of those. The problem, though, when you have a housing crisis, uh, you can't move. You're stuck in your city. You're stuck in your state. So the benefits of the American workforce that operated so positively in the past may not be as strong this time. Uh, and naturally, there are other things as well. The, the America has always been friendly for capital inflows, but we do see signs of protectionism. We do see signs of uh, uh, ambivalence, I would call it. But nonetheless, U.S. remains very strong if you look at the number of multinationals, R&D, and so on and so forth. And these strengths have not gone away. Uh, if we look at the past two decades in terms of competitiveness and what it means in terms of job growth or decline, you might make a generalization that 1990s were a moment of time when growth was basically created through employment creation, new jobs, technology revolution, the internet, and so on and so forth until 2001, 2002. Um, whereas the past decade, really, if you look at growth, it has been more from the employment decline, uh, restructuring, cutting, and so on and so forth. This is a nice way to cut your costs, but this is not a good way to raise your revenues. And therein lies the problem. There are problems with the regulatory overview systems in the United States. They tend to strangle new enterprise formation. We haven't seen a Silicon Valley that is very strong and, and geared towards the future. One way to look at the future would be to look at how did the countries who went through this contraction, how did they use it for their benefit? And how, for instance, did they invest into the so-called green recovery, green stimulus spending? And if you look at the stimulus packages in the blue here and then the size of the green sector inherent in them, you will find that Korea, of all countries, invested the most in relative terms. Uh, United States also invested more than in the past in comparable situations, but China invested still more in relative terms. So there is an understanding of the future in the United States. There are more investments to that direction, but they aren't enough. If we look at leading clean energy players, say the solar PV model manufacturers, and we look at their developments during the past eight years or so, you will find that still in 2005, the Japanese players were leading this sector. And many of these Japanese players, if not all, were created after the two energy crises in the 1970s. If you were to look at the same data two or three years ago, you might have found more American players there. And I think over time, you will still find more. However, now you see more and more Chinese players who are taking their positioning in this field. So you may have First Solar leading, but you also have Suntech Power, you have Jing Li, and you have JA Solar. And I think that this is, will be a very interesting race between these two great nations in, in the energy markets. For China, it is not the exports that's absolutely vital for the future alone. It is really the green technology, clean technology, energy technology, because in order to grow, you need to have industrialization. In order to have industrialization, you need urbanization. In order to have urbanization, you need infrastructure, real estate, property markets that are effective, and so on and so forth. If something hampers that development, uh, that spells trouble. Now, if you look at trade and investment, on the other hand, many people feel that, well, there have been positive developments. They always look at the short-term developments, the, the past two weeks, past months, two months, three months. But if you look at the developments from the point of view of 2007 to the present, you will find, using the Baltic Dry Index as an indicator, and certainly it's not the best one, but it's one of them. It's a sort of a rough shorthand. You will find that we are still maybe at the point of 11% of the 2008 peak. And many might argue, I might be one of them, that we may not see those peak levels for a long, long time to come. And that's because we are moving from something called globalization more towards regionalization, which is good for Asia, not so good for Europe or the United States in the long run. Now, if you look at trade and investment, there's another problem that's not often recognized as a problem. Who are the greatest trade partners of the United States? Western Europe, Europe as a whole, and Japan. Now, if you look at their developments, already three to four countries have been bailed out in, in Europe. And uh, the, the next speaker, I'm sure, will speak more about this. My personal view is that you will see more trouble. And uh, the, there, there will be serious fight on the, whether the center will hold in Europe. Uh, 
And the countries that are carrying the burden, the AAA countries, are increasingly hesitant to move on. Nonetheless, whatever might happen, we know that in the long run, the growth of these economies will not be what it has been until now for quite a long time. In the case of Japan, uh, due to the triple crisis, the things have got a lot worse, but we should remember that even before the triple crisis, World Bank warned Japan on the state of its banks, on the state uh, that the banks had in terms of capital reserve ratios. And there are serious demographical problems in terms of the population decline. And we also have a situation where you, you have uh, uh, declining savings and rising debt, which is a very bad combination and usually means a savings crisis sooner rather than later. So also in the case of Japan, there is something of a problem. These two great trade partners of the United States. What about then China? There is great ambivalence in the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. The campaign theme of last, uh, last time was China in a sort of a negative sense. Uh, China was portrayed as the destination taking away jobs from Americans uh, by both parties and in a way that I think the leaders of the, these two parties were uncomfortable with. Nonetheless, when you look at the offshoring numbers, and these are from the U.S.-China Business Council, you will find, if you look at, say, U.S. manufacturing capex in U.S. and China, that the offshoring of U.S. manufacturing to China has been greatly overstated. So I would be one of those who would argue that the U.S. actually should integrate more in terms of trade and investment with China rather than less, that it risks losing a, a very favorable position in China in this kind of a situation, in this kind of a uh, situation of ambivalence. Now, if we look at the U.S. investments in China, they are actually falling behind. If we look at the cumulative realized FDI in China in the past three years or so, uh, Hong Kong comes first, then Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, European Union, and only then United States. Most of my friends in China constantly argue that why doesn't the U.S. reassess the role of its export controls? We only get less than 10 percent of our high technology from the United States, although U.S. is the dominant power in the technology sector. Our leading technology partner is the European Union. It could be the other way around. And naturally, Americans are concerned of the dual-use technologies and how these technologies might be used in, in China. But I think that there is a time now to reassess a lot of the old uh, wisdom of consensus, if you will. Another serious argument is to make of the Chinese FDI. Until now, we've been in a situation where the capital has been moving towards China. Now capital, capital will be moving out from China. And this will create a very new kind of situation. This will no longer be just the world factory. It will continue to be that for quite a long time, especially in the second, third, fourth tier cities, particularly the third and fourth tier cities in China. But it will be more about consumption, more about demand, more about building social welfare systems in China and so on and so forth. Now, as the capital starts moving out from China, and if it is true that this might be a one to two trillion dollar opportunity in the next decade, the question is who will participate in this? Think about the post-war situation in Europe. The Europe was devastated. Most of the thriving economies had to be rebuilt. That meant great investment opportunities. There was Marshall Plan from the United States, great positioning to participate in this growth in a very positive way. Will we see this in the next decade or not? I think it's absolutely critical. It's a win-win for both sides, not win-win purely in the rhetorical terms, but in a positive economic development sense. If we look at the growth model, then finally, of the United States, what is it? One way to look at it is to use the expenditures approach and uh, look at the composition of the U.S. GDP. And as we know, it's still about 70 percent of consumption and uh, 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 exports that have been seen critical by the Obama administration.